So it becomes hopefully apparent, but hard to accept that the lot of mankind at present is like one great big mess. Okay. One great big mess. And the whole of the story won't be that way after. You know, in other words, once eternity begins, or for each one of us personally, once we die, that's really when happiness begins. Until then, it's a mess. What makes that fact harder to live with is that we start out empty. I've said this many times, but I keep on using it to show new applications. We start out empty. So we have an idea about what life should be based on body stuff, based on feel good, very childish, because we start out as children. And as we start to grow up, we start to realize that all those ideas we had aren't true. And a measure of maturation, the way to measure maturation is how you adjust to realizing just how untrue those notions are. It's hard, if not impossible, to actually adjust. I mean, a lot of people, more often, you're smarter people, they kill themselves. The whole reason for crime, really, is somebody being so upset at something not working the way he wants that he resorts to crime to make it work the way he wants. Of course, it never that never pans out. But, uh, you know, the carrot of crime is that, oh, if you do this, you'll get that. But you don't. Or when you get it, it's not, it doesn't live up to your expectations. Disappointment. Everything ends up a disappointment. Everything ends up small and low and slow. And golly, you know, I thought if I got this part and became a movie star and all this good stuff happened to me and I worked so hard to get here and now I'm here and... Silence. Because basically all you get for that is more trouble. Yeah, you have moments, but you can be poor and have good moments, too. And Solomon is the quintessential guy to talk about that. I mean, he had everything in, in, in ancient terms. He really did. What made Israel famous and rich was her location. And the fact that the Jews were known to be the best architects, because they had 400 years of training building temples. They were known to be the best singers, because that was part of the deal. They were known to be the best actors, the best accountants, the best pretty much of everything. That was part of the promise that God made to Abraham, and it passed through the genes. I would bet you money that pretty much any talented person you see anywhere on this planet, I don't care what their skin color is or their alleged nationality or ethnicity is, they got one of Abraham's genes in them. Because that's how God fulfills his promise to Abraham. Stars of the sky, innumerable. Well, there you go. And being placed in the center of three continents with all those people moving up and down. And if you have talented, good-looking people, well, what do you think happens? They have many babies, and they're fertile, too. Good health, long life, smart. What do you expect? 
And that is a blessing to the whole human race if all those genes dispersed amongst the whole population. Survival of the fittest? Hmm? Although if you go out evolution go into evolution, it's really survival of the fattest. Fat people. Look how many fat people there are. I happen to be one of them now because I'm getting old. Well, what's that? That's the efficiency of your body. You stop moving, honey, you gain weight. That's efficiency. That's a talent of your genes that you inherited. Now, it seems to be kind of far afield, but the point is, is that all the goodies you get, they got these dark undersides going with them. And most of us don't even get a, but a few of the goodies. So the carrot's always out in front. Oh yeah, I work just a little bit harder. And why are we doing that? Why are we living that way? Because when we were children, that's how it was. The fairy stories. When you're a child, you believe. What's attractive about children, what's attractive about youth, what's attractive, period, is to see somebody have faith. It's so beautiful to see a person believe. That's really what everybody finds attractive. Children believe. They believe just about anything. That's the problem with it. That's the dark underside. Oh, but they're so beautiful when they believe. They're so happy. Because belief makes you happy. When you believe in something or someone, it makes you happy. It's the beginning of love. And unhappiness comes toward the end of your life. Because primarily you learn, you get disappointed, you learn to stop believing. Now, that's the basic route that man travels. In some ages, we've died at age 35, like in the Middle Ages, you were an old man if you were 35. As Moses himself said in Psalm 90, about verse, I think it's verse 10, your normal life expectancy then, and really it's still true now, was 70 and 80 if you were in really good health. That's still true today. Part of what I do for a living. Your actual, you know, official life expectancy tables um, tend to go usually to a maximum of age 120. But the number of people actually living that long is almost nobody. Over 90% of the population is dead by age 80. Pretty much like Moses said. That was Moses saying it. Back in Psalm 90, when he himself, get this, what, guys, got such a sense of humor. Moses was 119 years old when he wrote Psalm 90. We know that because he penned Genesis in the same year. I did the meter videos on both Genesis and Psalm 90. You can go look it up yourself. He, taught, he makes them refer to each other. The text and the meter refer back to each other. So it's hard for me to tell which was actually first. Okay, he might have written Psalm 90 before he wrote Genesis. He might have written Genesis to illustrate Psalm 90. And then the other five books. All written in the last year of his life. The last year of his life. Now Moses in particular was very disappointed. In fact, God told him. God took him up to Mount Nebo and said, Hi, you can look, but you can't touch. Because when we got to Second Meribah, I told you to speak to the rock. As your average theologian will tell you, well, that was to depict the future risen Christ. Christ is always depicted as a rock in the Old Testament. Greek word is Petra, and it's used in Matthew 16, 18. He's pointing and talking to himself about himself. He's not talking about Peter at all. So that's why Moses was supposed to speak to the rock. But he didn't. He struck it. 
He struck it the first time they were at Meribah, and he struck it the second time they were at Meribah. And God said, you made me look bad in front of the people, which is a sort of euphemism, okay, about, you know, responsibility in front of the dumb people that you have to rule. And therefore, you don't get to go to the promised land, but they will. So he took him up to Mount Nebo. He got to see the whole of the beautiful land of milk and honey, which, you know, is not milk and honey now. It's going to be in the millennium. And that was Moses' big disappointment. And so God tempers that disappointment and flips it. Oh, by the way, you get the most glorious thing on earth that you could possibly ever want, or in heaven for that matter, you get to write scripture. Do you know how coordinated and integrated Moses' mind had to be for him to be able to write like that? And when you see the meter, it blows you away. The perfection of the writing. And it's not just Moses, it's all of them. There is no way you can read Bible in Hebrew and Greek, especially when you see the meter, and not know that God exists. It's, it's just, it, I don't know, you have to be made of stone. Not to believe. In which case you'll be happy instead of disappointed. But you know what? People don't even think about wanting to know God until they've had so many disappointments. So here's the future for all of us. We start out with all these big dreams being fed into our souls. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, that's good. I want to be a fireman when I grow up until you find out what being a fireman really is. And then you wish you never heard of it. And then we grow up and we try to realize our dreams. And I don't know which is worse, getting what you tried to get or not. Because it's always a disappointment. And only then, when all this world stuff proves to be a disappointment or certain selected items that you really counted on they didn't deliver only then do we look up and oh well, gee maybe God really exists after all but by then we've been taught so many times that God is a st that only stupid people believe in God frankly you're stupid not to but hey the human race is nothing if not reversing so you come to your own disappointments in life before you look up and you find God. That's the path. That's the path that every human travels. It's just a question of when and where and how and what particulars and what age and, you know, what broke you. In my case, I was broken when I was like 7 and 10. Some other people, they don't get broken until they're 50. And we all have a different, like, wake-up call. So it's not a question of being better. It's a question of understanding that the variation in human recognition that life is shit takes time. Now God has since eternity past known all this, but we don't. God has provided for all of our stupidities and upsets and disappointments and at every single opportunity of every single moment of every single day. He's waiting to, like, show you something. It's one great big conversation. That's what he wants. Why? I Every day I ask him that question. But it is what he wants. What pleases God is for you to be in conversation with him. He wants that fellowship with you. And it doesn't matter at all to him that you're, you know, a son of Belial. You could be an axe murderer and he would still want fellowship with you, which is very hard for other people to understand. Because what we want is a condition of fellowship with him. Is we want to be able to give him our vegetables and say, See, I'm this good person. I deserve to have contact with you. Because that's how we treat each other. That's why life is always a disappointment. Because we're always looking for unconditional love, and here's God who gives it, and we don't want him. We don't want that. 
We say we do, or we're big liars. What we want is totally conditional love. We want love to be based on how good we are and, wh- and how well we perform. And of course, then when we don't perform and then we're not loved anymore, we get all bent out of shape and hurt and disappointed. This one great big rat race. And you come to the end of the rat race and you're rich or you're poor or you're sick or you're well or you've got a ton of friends or none or you're talented or not. And what the hell does it matter? The worm wins in the end, just like Edgar Allan Poe said. But that's the point with God. There is an end. And between the day you're born and the day you die, your birth was something he himself did. You exist because he personally made your soul and put it into whatever body was exiting your mother's womb. She wasn't your mother until he put the soul in the body. Did he put it in a sick body? Did he put it in a pretty body? Did he put it in an ugly body? And whatever body it is that you got, and whatever life it is that you got, you can always and validly say to God, why me? Why'd you give me this life? Because you're mad about the life you've got, or because it's too good? Take your pick. Then, of course, anything in between. You can always say that. And he's always got an answer. But it's not a small answer. It's a big one. Why did I make you? Yeah, it's going to take like forever for him to answer that question. He wants it to take that long. So at this point in life, this stage, Paul was talking about the whole thing in Romans 8. We, you know, hello, your flesh can't do anything for God. God can do something for you. And the first thing he did for you was have Christ pay for your sins on the cross before you were even born. And then God the Father ordered your birth. That's the thing that impressed David so much in Psalm 139. Okay, now you're here. He voted for you. Do you want to vote for him? Do you want to know? Do you want to find out why the hell he did this thing? Do you want to know him? You can. Notice how it's all vertical. It has absolutely nothing to do with what other people think of you or what even you think of you. He made you the way you are. And yeah, pretty much everything else is what you want to do with you. But you could say, God, I don't like me. Or what do you want me to be? I want this and I want that and I want the other thing. What do you want? Because what you want is a relationship with him. That's what he wants to hear. That's what he wants it to lead to. Because he wants that relationship with you evidenced by the fact that you exist. See, Descartes was a real idiot. He said, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. No, God thinks, therefore, you are. Cogita ergo sum. Because God thinks you exist. That's what David's saying at the end of Psalm 139. God exists. He had you in mind. And therefore now you exist. And you can say like David says in verse 17. How precious are your thoughts, O God. David's believing. He's happy. And all the rest of the shit that happened to him. And he went through stuff that we don't even know how to explain. So bad. It's all okay. I get to know you and whatever else I go through, I got you. And we sing how oh, how Jesus loves me when we're kids and we have absolutely no idea how much or even what the word loves means. 
But at the end of your life, honey, instead of it being a disappointment, and the disappointments are there. They don't, God doesn't take them away. But you got balancing against them all. Your own cross. The beauty of knowing him. So his thought, his precious thought is, get them made. I want all these souls to exist, and I want them saved, Second Peter 3, 9. God is never willing that anybody should perish, which is why hell lasts forever. Because then they always have the opportunity to vote out. Yes, I believe in Christ. That opportunity forever exists. <laughs> and he's just sitting there. And he'll do everything for you. So that one day you might say at one moment. Your tiny little volition. Even if you're 50. Oh gee God. You know. I, I, everything's a disappointment here. Why'd you do this? Even if you're angry. It's a contact. What was that? Paul was saying, talking about this. He had two things primarily they said about it. The first one, I'm not sure where it is. I think it's in Corinthians, where he was talking about how he would, with those who are, you know, nervous about eating meat offered to idols, he wouldn't touch meat. And those who could eat it with a clean conscience, he'd eat it with them. And his idea, what he says in the passage is, look, anybody, if by any means I can save some. He was literally prostituting himself for the gospel. Anything, I, whatever culture I got to cave into in order to be able to give the gospel out, that's what I'm going to do. He was that desperate for people to be saved so they could know the same God he himself had the privilege of knowing so intimately. He didn't want them to miss out. So yeah, I'll prostitute myself. I'll be a fool. I think that's in Second Corinthians somewhere. Where he says, uh, you know, or it might be Galatians. See, you know, I made myself a fool for you. Going on and on, yeah, Second Corinthians 10. Going on and on and on about my revelations from God. I made myself a fool. And is there and with the Galatians. You want me to build tents so that I don't take your money? So that I just give the gospel for free so now you think it's worthless? Okay, I'll do that. You want to beat me up and I'll just hang here on the cross so that you can maybe see God? Yeah, I'll do that. That's what God's doing. Whatever it takes, Suntella, whatever it takes to complete, just get them, get the humans being born, put the souls in, at least they're alive, and once they're alive, they always have a chance to see me. They always have a chance to want me. And I want them and I'll do anything and everything for them no matter what it takes. Just get them born. So that's this first stage. And Paul likened it in Romans 8 to pregnancy. And the other place where he's talking about this same thing is... Um, I think it's in uh, Philippians 3, somewhere around verse 10 through 14. The Greek words are I pulse, and it's usually translated if by any means. It should be translated if by whatever means. And it's usually they translate I attain. The e exit resurrection, the Greek word there is exonostasis. What he's saying is, look, whether I die and go to heaven, or whether the rapture hits while I'm talking, and I get there by any means. See, that's the whole point. I pulse. What? It should be pronounced A pulse. E I is if. Pulse P O S, but the O looks like a W. W whatever means. If by whatever means. I see 
God, I get home. If by whatever means, just get the bodies out there. This is God's decree concept. Just get them born. Get the souls in them. Give them the chance to see. And all they have to do is believe. Even a nanosecond at the very end of your life. Because God will make it clear. And then he uses humans too. He doesn't really need us. But it's our privilege to be able to talk about this. If by whatever means. Get them born. Get them saved. And then in the eternal state. Most of us. Will have said no, 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 no. I want my childish ideas to be realized, even if I'm disappointed. Anything so long as I can say no to God. Yeah, but you said once when you were at the bottom of your life, when you've been disappointed, 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 and you were drowning. You believed in Christ in that moment. Of course, later, when you got rescued, you forgot all about him or you were embarrassed because you believed and you wanted to shove that under the rug. Okay, fine, but you got saved for that nanosecond in your weakness. So now you're going to wake up in heaven and for the first time, it's like, oh, then you'll know. This whole shooting match. This whole messy scenario. This whole messy life. That sounds all sugar and spice in the beginning. We find out that it's all rust. And dirt. And worms. At the end. That's the price he's willing to pay. Alongside the cross. We're talking the logistics of realizing the payment on the cross was to pay for your sins so therefore all the rest of you could go to heaven. He didn't really need the money. The thought money. He didn't need it. You're the one who needs it. You need to know that you're paid for so you won't be uncomfortable in heaven. To be faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. It's the end of Jude. He threw that at me while I was talking. So that we won't feel guilty. We won't feel bad. We won't feel intimidated. We really are blameless. He really did pay. That's what it's really for. Because he just flat wants you to exist. And the fact that you exist is the proof of it. You want proof of God? You're it. Conclusive. Absolute. Proof of God. You're it. Of course, you're going to not necessarily know that that's true. But you can ask the ceiling. Every day. Because it's a relationship. It's not just one moment. Okay, I've had my moment of proof with God. Now I'm going to live on that moment of proof forever. That's not what it's about. It's about relationship. And by the way, because it's relationship with a real person who's really living, who's really communicating with you, there's your proof. But that's not why you want it. You want the relationship. Every minute while I'm talking, I have proof of him. Constant. I can't get away from it. Sometimes I really want to. But relationship is about relationship. The fact that it's also proof is kind of ancillary. By any means, get them born. I don't care how they live, whatever they do. I mean, really, there are, you know, advantages and disadvantages. Okay, sin is not exactly a good thing to do. There are a lot of really strong reasons for that, like you don't drink gasoline. But you don't know that at first. And you poo-poo in your pants. And then God delivers you out of it. And one time you poo-pooed too many. And you get desperate. And you look up at the ceiling. And you finally believe in him. And therefore all the past poo-poo of you and everybody else. Just got justified because he got you. And you say, but I'm not worth it. You are to God. I am the God. There is no accounting for taste, okay? 
He wanted you. He made you. You're here. That's proof. Now what? Well, more than now what is, there are all these other billions of human beings who are born, who've been born, who've died. Anything to get them. If by any means, I post, just get them be born. Get them through the gates. Get out the message. Let them know how to be saved. And of course, there's a whole lot more than that. But most of us don't care. Okay. You'll care when you're dead. So that's what really it is about eternity. Is that you can start learning him down here now. Or wait till you're dead. And then it's kind of like those who didn't wait till they died and learned a lot about him down here. That gets sort of like multiplied into a great deal more knowledge and competence and all the rest of it. So that all those people who died without knowledge of him, who are going to want it the second they're dead, can get it. Because if you die without knowledge of him, you don't have a vertical pipeline, as it were, of knowledge and mechanisms established. You've only got a horizontal one. You oriented to people. You oriented to things. You oriented to your body. All down here, horizontal, low to the ground. That's what you know. That's how your soul works. Remember when I was talking about integration and I did all those pictures in the Vimeo videos with the purple and the brown? Well, we most of us are going to die with brown souls, which means we're horizontally oriented to life. So in order for us to understand anything about God, even though we have a direct connection to Him at all times, even now, we look horizontal to get our information and that's how we stay so the teachers the people who got the vertical down here before they died are the ones equipped to also translate it into a horizontal for the other people who only operate horizontally in their minds if by any means God got you you don't want a horizontal, you won't want a vertical connection to him down here. Okay, he still wants you because you exist. And you, there's never going to be a day when you don't exist. You change bodies. Once. There's point of demand, wants to die, yes. And then the judgment. What is it? Hebrews 9.27. He just threw that at me. There's no such thing as reincarnation. <laughs> that would be cruel. But life has to be free and you got to have your shot at saying whether you want him or not. And that's what this first stage of your life is. Think of this life down here as a stage. It's the body stage. It's the limited stage. When you're dead, you're going to heaven or hell. Even if you're going to hell, you still got the opportunity to get out. That's stage two. As my pastor likes to put it, stage three is eternity. But you could collapse it into two stages, alive or dead. But you're still alive when you're dead in a different place. And you're going to go right on living. Now the takeaway from this is that when you look at everything and everyone around you, they're wasting their time. They're occupied with all these nonsensical things. We're here today and gone tomorrow, vapor trail. I mean, there's nothing older than yesterday's news. Whatever news and things are going on today, oh, everybody's all hot to talk about it. And then when it's gone, well, you know, just ask anybody in Hollywood or in modeling. Oh, you're all the cats meow today. A year from now, people barely remember your name. Always learning, never coming to an epinosis knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy two twenty six through three seven. That's the way the world works. 
They're, they're, it's like everybody's on a conveyor belt. Ooh, ooh, look, look. Yeah, and once the image that they're looking at has moved on because the conveyor belt has moved, they forget all about it. Sick Transit Gloria Mundi. Now, that's where the whole human race is. It's not just your soul having the opportunity to learn him while it is yet today. Thank you, Daddy Hebrews 4, 3 and 4. But everybody else. The obnoxious guy that, you know, you're answering in the comments in beta news who obviously just wants to be a troll, but he's calling you one because he's the one who's the troll. Tomorrow he might actually be interested in God. Or maybe he even is today, but he's having a bad hair day. Wouldn't you want him to be saved? Wouldn't you want him to be happy? Wouldn't you want him to have belief? Of course, if you're the troll, then somebody else is thinking that of you, especially God. So that's why this thing is so messy. That's why it's so disappointing. Because anything that's not God is disappointing. Put your belief in anything not God, and you're just on a conveyor belt. It's full of sound and fury signifying nothing. All tales wagged by idiots, not just told. So when you get in your car, when you go to the grocery store, when you're on the phone, when you're watching television, this whole mass and mass of humanity with all of its wasted ideas and preoccupations signifying nothing, that's why God lets it be there. In fact, he doesn't just let it, he orchestrates it. Without, you know, gerrymandering your free will and, in fact, preserving your free will, which is why a lot of atheists think that if God exists, he has to be immoral. You let so-and-so kill so-and-so. Yeah, he did. He even ensured the ability for the gun to work. God could have stopped the gun from working. Did you get cancer? He could stop it. Do you have cerebral palsy? He could stop it. Why doesn't he? Those are valid arguments. And God is himself begging the question. Why don't you ask me why I let it go on? What happened to Paul? 2 Corinthians 10. Thank you, Dad. Thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what that is. And there's endless useless speculation about what kind of problem did Paul have that was his thorn in the flesh. Just like everybody's needlessly speculating about what did Jesus Christ write on the ground when he was being accused by, the, when this adulterous woman was accused by the Pharisees in the first ten verses of John, John 8. Those are useless preoccupations. Here's what you got to ask. Why was he writing on the ground? Why did, why, not what, why, different W. Why did Paul have a thorn in the flesh? Paul was a believer, right? He was one of the great heroes of the Bible, right? He's one of the greatest believers who ever lived, right? Yeah, he himself even knew that. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 10. I labored more than all of them. And it's also at the beginning of Galatians. And I want to say it's at the beginning of 1st or 2nd Timothy. He knew he was the greatest. So then why did he get the thorn in the flesh? Well, Jesus Christ is the greatest person who ever lived. Why did he get the cross? See? Misfortune doesn't always occur to injure. It's a famous Latin proverb. I forget the Latin words. Why, if you have a problem right now, why did God give it to you? You might as well say that. If he's letting it happen, it's a gift. Because he's going to make a gift out of it. Well, then what kind is it? 
one of the gifts is to let everything in this world be what it is and show how it doesn't matter. Bring it all in. I post by whatever means, whatever it takes. And you will or will not learn those things this side of heaven. But you will learn them on the other side of heaven. And that's what heaven really is. Is we're all sitting there. Oh, oh, this is what you meant. Oh, this is how it works. Oh, wow. Look at this. This was your will for my life. Because, you know, you had all your memories and everything. And what you don't know is... You know, if you didn't learn Bible enough, what you don't know is what God meant for by all that stuff that happened to you. But you're going to know when you're dead. And it will be amazing. All the things that humans want out of this life. And we all kind of know that and hope for that and talk about that. And everybody makes fun of us when we want it. Everything you ever wanted out of this life, you're going to get in the next. But better than that, you're going to get what God wanted you to have. And one of the things he wants you to have is to understand what this life was for. All the suffering and all the stupidity and all the rejection and all the idiocy and all the stuff with all the other people around you who didn't get it. You know, because we humans are quintessentially stupid. Why all that waste? You know, you'll know. And you'll be amazed. What was it? I, things that the eye has not seen nor ear heard. God is prepared for those who love him. That's um, referred to in, what was it? Ephesians 3.20. It's oblique there. But you can pretty much take that quote and search on it. And you'll find it in various places in the New Testament and all. I think it's in Isaiah. Now, that's his delight to do that. He has a will. Right now I'm standing at a kitchen counter. Is that really God's will that I stand at the kitchen counter? Or did he want me to be standing in the bedroom? Did he want me to be standing at all? And you say, well, that's petty. Not necessarily when you see how beautiful the idea is and whatever the context. Did God want you to be standing with the Rolls Royce? You wouldn't have any trouble saying that was God's will. You would kind of expect, well, that ought to be God's will to have all these nice things. But what if it's nicer to have it be bad. And we can't appreciate that this side of heaven, but there's going to come a day when you're dead to see the tapestry of his will and the beauty of what he had planned for each one of us. And we're all going to be talking about that like forever. In Raleigh, we got other things that are, we're going to be learning about him. But that's part of it. This massive weaving together. Here's what reality is that you lived. Okay, but for the reality you're living right now, God had a highest and best that he will instead. When you're dead, you'll find out what it was. It, to the extent you keep on trying to learn and live on Bible, you'll be closer to what it is. And then when you're dead, you'll find out how close it was and enjoy that too. In other words, no matter how far down you go, if by any means, get the souls born. Get them to believe in Christ. Once they die, then they'll know if they don't want to learn before. It's a massive rescue operation. And a whole lot more than that. And when your dad is like, oh wow, I was using Bible doctrine at that moment on vitamin C. I had no idea it was so beautiful. Yeah, because you were living the moment and you were kind of like in a daze. But you'll find out what it looked like to God when you were living that moment. And that means you find out more about Him. Plus, everybody else around you. We all are going to have our little story. We're like little walking movies. And we're the star of our own movies. You know, it's kind of like going to the Renaissance Fair. 
And one guy has decided, you know, he's a stockbroker by day, but he loves the Renaissance Fair. So he plays, you know, one of the Harlequin. Okay, Joker for the King. That's the role he likes to play. Okay. Well, whatever you are in real life, there's a role that you're actually playing. You don't even know what it is. God knows. And that's all going to be public in the eternal state. And we want it to be public because each one of us is a little stone, a little piece of chip off the whole block. Petros means a chip off of Petra, bedrock. Petra is Christ's name in the Old Testament. No. Petras is the name for Peter in Greek, which they mask because they invented the new word Petram, Petros, from the Greek. And then they cover it all up so you don't know that Christ was appointing himself as the rock. And I did videos on that showing you live in the Vulgate how they covered it up in the Pope myth videos. The point is, you really are a chip of him. You really do reflect him. And you have no idea how much. Because you're busy trying to figure out, oh, let's see, um, do I wash this dish? And do I have to do a right click or a left click? And, um, oh, golly, you know what? I think I forgot to put gas in the tank. That's your life. You don't notice the other impact of it. God does. And when you're dead, you will. Not just you, but everybody else. It's going to be endlessly, endlessly entertaining. All these walking movies around. In our new resurrection bodies, whatever they are in the eternal state. Well, actually, yeah. Before that, actually, at the second advent. For us. That's what he's doing. Taking all this mess... And turning it into one unendingly delicious meal or activity. And he loves it. It doesn't look like it now. That's how it's going to be. Because he wants that. Because he wants you. <laughs>